All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Thanks for, so much for joining me um, today. My name is Victor Hart. I'm an account executive here at Demand Driven Technologies. And in today's session, I'm going to be taking you through a demonstration of our supply chain um, software built for NetSuite called IntuaFlow. Um, a couple of housekeeping items here at the top of the call. Um, this meeting is being recorded, so you will um, receive an email um, following today's session with a link to that recording. Um, there's going to be time at the end of the call for a Q&A session. And so in your Zoom, you'll see a, a button for the Q&A as you have questions that come up throughout the presentation. Please put those in the Q&A. We'll get to as many questions as we can. If we don't have time to answer everybody's questions, we will follow up directly with you via email after the, uh, the session to get those um, questions answered. All right, so with that, um, let's get into the agenda for today. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background um, about demand-driven technologies, who we are as a company. And then I'm going to get into the, uh, the um, underlying logic that our software supports because it's an innovative way of, of planning um, supply chains that's helping companies all across the world um, dramatically improve their results. So we'll cover the basics of that and then we'll jump into IntuaFlow in NetSuite and um, go through the demonstration of the software. So we're demand-driven technologies. We're based in Atlanta, Georgia. We were founded in 2011, and we were the first to market with a suite of software solutions that supports this innovative methodology that's called a demand-driven MRP or DDMRP. We're the only DDMRP solution built natively for NetSuite that you'll see um, in today's presentation. And we've implemented in well over 100 clients on six different continents, which makes us very much the global leaders in terms of demand-driven implementations. Here are just a few of our clients. And what you can see is that over our 10 plus years in business, we've proven that this demand-driven approach can be very successful in many different industries within the manufacturing and distribution space. The reason we were founded um, in the beginning is to help deliver superior results to our clients. And what this chart shows us is the inventory turnover rates in US manufacturing over the past 25 or so years, courtesy of the Federal Reserve. And what we can see is that despite the billions of dollars that have been invested in ERP systems, supply chain planning, inventory planning systems, et cetera, those inventory turnover rates have remained largely static over that time period. And the reason is because all of those systems rely on outdated planning logic, specifically traditional MRP. MRP, as many of you probably know, is the primary planning logic that's built into all of the major ERP systems. Um, it was introduced back in the 70s, and the logic really hasn't evolved since then. And at a really high level, MRP is reliant on a forecast. The forecast is applied at the finished good level. MRP blows it down through the bill of material, and that's what drives our planning activities. There is one major flaw that's inherent in that logic, and that's the assumption that the forecast is going to be accurate. And as we all know, forecasts, by definition, are inaccurate. The more precise we try to be down to the item location level, the more profound that inaccuracy becomes. And so over time, by relying on that inaccurate demand signal, companies end up with what we call a bimodal inventory distribution, which simply means at any given point in time, they have too much of the wrong materials and too little of the right. And then because of this, planners don't trust the signals that they're getting out of their MRP systems. So they take data out of NetSuite, put it into spreadsheets in an attempt to plan a bit more effectively. And then that's obviously a very manual process, is prone to user error, et cetera. And so our thought is there has to be a better way. And that's where demand-driven MRP or DDMRP comes into play. Rather than planning to a forecast from a day-to-day -day operational standpoint, DDMRP is a consumption-driven model. So instead of planning to that inaccurate forecast, we are reacting to consumption as it comes in from the market. The idea being that actual demand is the most accurate demand signal we can possibly use. And so if we plan to that, 
we can much more closely align our inventory levels with what that actual market demand is, improving fill rates, reducing overall inventory levels, et cetera. To do this, you'll see that we leverage what are called DDMRP buffers, um, which are essentially dynamic stocking buffers is a good way to think about it. There's three zones within each buffer. The green zone sets my average order size as well as my typical ordering cadence. So frequently we'll use an MOQ to size the green zone. Frequently we'll use a desired replenishment cycle, such as if we want to replenish materials on a weekly or a monthly basis. So there are various technique, techniques we can use to size the green zone. The yellow zone is sized to cover the usage over lead time. So on average for a given lead time, how much of an item are we gonna be consuming? And then the red zone is the safety that's embedded within the buffer. It's there to protect us against variation, be that variable demand patterns, inconsistent lead times or the like. The more variation there is with an item, the thicker that red zone needs to be to protect against that. Very similar in concept to the traditional safety stock. The big difference is safety stocks are a static number that usually get reevaluated on a quarterly basis, if you're really good, most of the time it's annually or maybe twice a year. These buffers are dynamically adjusting on a daily basis, so they'll pick up on changes in our consumption much more rapidly. So here's a, a look at that. Each one of these bars represents an individual day, so you can see how the buffers resize themselves over time. And then we know when to create new replenishment orders and for how much based on what's called the net flow equation and where that falls within the buffer. The math is very simple. The net flow is our current on-hand inventory plus any open supply that we have minus any qualified demand. Demand is gonna qualify if it's due to be fulfilled either today or in the past, or if it's what's called a qualified spike, which is simply firm demand that's already in the system due out in the future, such as a work order that's scheduled for tomorrow, but it's due soon enough and the quantity is great enough that we want to go ahead and factor it into this net flow today. So this is basically just a summary of everything that's flowing in and out of each location for each item. And the way that it works is the net flow position starts out at the top of the green zone. Over time, as we consume materials, that net flow decreases with respect to the buffer. And once it drops out of the green zone into either the yellow or red zone, that triggers an order recommendation with the quantity being enough to get that net flow back up to the top of the green zone. So we should see the net flow fluctuating around the buffer like so. When we get in the software, you'll see we can also track our actual on-hand inventory levels and where those are fluctuating within the buffer to give us a good visual way of judging how successfully we've been managing our inventory levels. Another key concept that we'll touch on is the idea of strategic decoupling. And what that means is we don't place these buffers necessarily at every location for every single item. We only want to place them where we want to maintain strategic stocking levels um, of our materials. But anywhere we do place a buffer, we can expect constant material availability, which essentially decouples us from any upstream variability. So for example, if we apply a buffer at the raw material level, we no longer have to consider the um, replenishment lead time from my suppliers because I know that I'm going to have the material um, available when I need it. So by strategically placing these buffers throughout the bill of material, throughout the supply network, we can dampen variability and um, reduce the uh, potential impact that the bullwhip effect might have on us. So identifying those strategic decoupling points is the first step in any implementation of DDMRP. Where are we gonna be keeping these stocking buffers versus where are items going to be what's called non-buffered, which would be either a make to order, or buy to order item or something like that. Once we identify the decoupling points, we then build out what are called buffer profiles. We'll see this in the software. A buffer profile is simply a way to group like items together based on similar attributes, um, similar lead times, similar variability patterns and the like. Just makes it easier to manage the overall health of the system. Um, once we apply 
those buffer profiles. The buffers dynamically adjust throughout time based on our fluctuating consumption. You'll see that we give very clear prioritization based on how deeply the net flow has penetrated the buffer. And it's very easy as the system makes recommended replenishment orders to execute on the, all of those in mass. So I mentioned that our goal is to help our clients achieve superior results. What does that look like? Well, the buffers are designed to ensure constant material availability. So the first goal is protecting high service levels or on time in full rates. And our clients have typically achieved um, aggregate service levels in the 99% um, percent range, 97 to 99% or so. Via that strategic decoupling, we've seen manufacturing clients compress their cumulative lead times by as much as 80%. And because we're planning to a more accurate signal, we've seen clients be able to achieve those metrics while carrying on average about 20 to 45% less inventory. So really great sustainable results that have a real impact on the business. But it's really important for us to be able to prove that we're gonna be able to achieve those results. And for that reason, during our pre-sales process at no cost to the client, we run what we call simulations. And I think this is something that makes us unique in the software world is we can take your actual historical data and then model how would this dynamic buffering logic have managed your materials based on the demand that you experienced over a year or two year period compare that to actual performance. And it lets us, A, confirm that this methodology is going to be a good fit and then estimate the value that we might be able to bring. So this is an example of an individual item that we simulated for a client last year. This daily poll shows 12 months of actual demand history that they provided, of, provided us. Each one of these bars represents an individual day of demand. And then above that, you can see the results of the simulation, how the buffers would have sized themselves in response to that demand, and the black line shows the simulated on-hand inventory levels at the end of each day. So with this specific item, we were able to show this client that had they been using Intuaflow over this time period, they would have achieved 100% service level while carrying on average 60% less inventory than they had at the time that we ran the simulation. So we can get that visibility here at the item level, can roll it up all the way up to the aggregate level, and it really helps us to prove that Intuaflow is going to be able to bring value to your organization. If anyone is interested in this, please let us know. We'd be happy to, uh, to run this analysis using your actual um, uh, demand history. Now, when we get into the software, there's going to be two aspects of Intuaflow that I'm going to touch on today, and we won't have time to go into the really deep details on each one, so it's going to be fairly high level, but the two aspects are materials planning and then sales and operations planning, or SNOP. The materials planning piece is what's going to give us our daily replenishment signals based on this buffering logic that we've talked about. What do I need to buy, make, or distribute today? Where SNOP comes into play is taking our existing settings and projecting them out into the future based on a forecast that gets uploaded into the system. So there's still a place for forecast in this demand-driven model. And the way that we use it is to test our, um, our current settings, doing a stress test on it, if you will. Um, Based on the demand that we expect in the future, projecting these buffers, ensuring that they're going to be sufficient to manage that demand, if not alerting us so that we can make adjustments now to keep our environment healthy um, over that, uh, that expected time period. So with that, let's jump into the software. Um, like I mentioned, we are uh, built natively for NetSuite, so there's no kind of integration or anything like that that's required. Um, everything with Intuaflow is living inside your NetSuite instance, and so you can see that we've got this tab here. This is where all of our um, functionality is going to live. For time purposes today, I've already pre-populated um, a bunch of tabs to help keep, uh, keep myself on track. 
So where I want to start is by looking at a specific item so we can see the calculations that are being done automatically in the background. Not necessarily a level of detail that you would want to come to on a daily basis, but I think it's useful to understand the logic and why the system is making recommendations. Um, then we'll take a step back and go more high level. If I'm a buyer, a planner, et cetera, how do I come into NetSuite, see all of my priorities today, execute on those and monitor the overall health of the environment? So to start, I'm going to look at a specific part PPJ at my plant location. We apply these buffers at the item location level because if we have the same part at multiple different locations, demand might be different at each location, the lead times might be different, et cetera. So we want to manage them independently. So this is part PPJ at the plant location. Um, over here in the top, I see my replenishment method. This is a buffered item, but I mentioned that not necessarily is every item going to be buffered. And we'll see some examples of that. Um, if you have a really slow moving item, maybe a dynamic buffer isn't appropriate for it. Maybe a more static min max is appropriate. Um, if you have um, a highly customized finished goods, then we don't want to keep those in stock, but we want to stock the appropriate raw materials so that we can meet our lead time promises to our customers. But this item is buffered, so we're keeping it in stock. And then we can see the buffer profile assigned to it. It's a B11M profile. That actually tells me a lot about this item. Um, it indicates that it's a purchase part. It's a short lead time, which in my environment is between 1 to 28 days. It's a low variability item, so it's a really steady runner. And we're sizing the green zone based on an MOQ. If this was a highly variable item, that might be a B15M buffer profile, which would impact how reactive the red zone is to fluctuations in demand. This buffer sizing section shows me how the buffer is sized as of today. So we can see the red, yellow, and green zone. And then the net flow is represented by this blue line here. Instantly upon looking at this, I know that I've got an order recommended against this item to get that net flow out of the yellow zone and back up to the top of the green zone. And then I can also see my on-hand inventory and compare that to my expected average inventory. We're never planning specifically to this expected average inventory level, but as you'll see, it's a good metric for me to have to ensure that my actuals are in line with where I want them to be. And it's a very simple calculation. The expected average inventory equals the red zone plus one half of the green zone. So as my buffers size themselves over time, my expected average inventory will adjust along with that. If I wanna see the underlying math that's going into how this buffer is calculated today, that's very visible to me here in my buffer calculation tab. So my green zone, as I mentioned, we're using an MOQ in this instance to size the green zone. I have a 20 unit MOQ, therefore my green zone is sized to 20. The yellow zone covers our usage over a lead time. So we take our lead time, in this case, 10 days for this part, and multiply it by what's called our um, average daily usage or effective daily usage. There are multiple ways that we could arrive at that daily usage number. Some clients have it purely historical, so maybe a 100-day rolling historical average of their consumption. Some clients, particularly with very seasonal businesses, prefer to use a forecast to arrive at that daily usage number, and other clients blend the two together. So various techniques that we can use to arrive at our daily usage number, um, and then that goes into the sizing of the yellow zone is also factored into the sizing of the red zone as well. And then we apply what's called a variability factor to that red zone, the degree of which is determined by the buffer profile assigned to the item. So that's how the buffer zones were sized. And then to the right, we see the net flow math, which again is our current on-hand inventory plus any open supply minus any qualified demand. That gives me a net flow position of 69 units today because that's in the yellow zone, I have an order recommended to get that net flow position back up to the top of the green zone, which is at 110. Therefore, my recommended reorder quantity is 41 units for this item today. 
If I want to get more granular and see the actual transactions that are being factored into that net flow, I can see that via my part activity tab. This is gonna show me all the open transactions that this item is currently featured on. Anything in red or blue is being factored into my net flow today. Red represents demand, blue represents supply. Now this is a fairly simple part. It's simply purchased and resold. So all of my supply are purchase orders. All of my demand transactions are sales orders. Um, but depending on the business, depending on the material types, you could have various different types of transactions that could constitute supply or demand. Um, sales orders, purchase orders, work orders, transfer orders, et cetera. Um, and we would want to factor all of that in. Uh, you can see we've got links to each of these transactions. So this open supply order um, was due three days ago. So we're a little late. I could click on that link to open up that specific transaction if I wanted to. We also see we've got a couple of these sales orders that are in bold down here. That's because those are those qualified spikes that I talked about that are due in the future, but we want to go ahead and factor them into our net flow today. The threshold that we typically establish for that, and it can be customized on a client by client basis, but in this instance, um, future demand is going to qualify as a spike if it's due within one lead time and the quantity is greater than or equal to one half of the red zone. My red zone as of today is 30 units. My lead time on this item, as we saw a minute ago, is 10 days. So any demand due in the next 10 days for 15 or greater units, such as this first sales order here, is going to qualify as one of those spikes. And then the other thing to note here um, in, the, in the part activity tab is our running balance. This is going to show us what our inventory position is going to be as these transactions come to fruition. And anytime that running balance column goes to a negative, that means we're going to be stocking out. So I can track that here at the part level if I come into this level of detail. The system, as you'll see in a little bit, will track all of my items running balance columns and, um, and alert me to any potential issues arising in the future. Um, we looked at the buffer sizing, which shows how the buffer is sized as of today. This part analytics view shows us a historical view of the buffer. I've got it set to the last six months. You can adjust that time horizon as you see fit. So this is showing me over the previous six months, how has the buffer sized itself? And you can see the dynamic nature of the buffer. It's increased and then dropped back down. That's all being driven by our consumption. So as our consumption for this item fluctuates throughout time, the buffer resized itself in response to that. I can add my net flow line on here and we can see that the planner responsible for this item has been doing a great job of following the logic. Every time that net flow position drops down into the yellow zone, the planners accepted the recommended order to get that net flow back up to the top of the green zone. And then I can add my actual on-hand inventory and see where that's fluctuating throughout the buffer. Um, this allows me to judge if I've been doing a good job managing this item or if I need to make some adjustments. What we want to see is exactly what we see here, the buffer or the, the on-hand inventory fluctuating around the low to mid part of the yellow zone. Occasionally, it's going to drop down and consume some of the red zone. That's perfectly fine. That's what the red zone's there for. Occasionally, it'll get up near the green zone. That's perfectly fine as well. Simply over time, we want to make sure that that actual on-hand inventory is fluctuating nicely around this expected average inventory line. Um, if, however, for example, I opened up this view and I saw that my actual on-hand inventories were constantly up near the green zone and never approached the red zone, well, that would tell me that I'm being too conservative. I'm carrying more material than I really need to. Um, I can thin out my buffers to get my inventory a little bit leaner without really being at risk of a stock out. Now, this item was a purchase part. If I wanted to create the purchase order directly from, um, from this record, I could click this Create Purchase Order button. That would then generate the purchase order transaction in NetSuite to go through whatever kind of approvals, processes, or workflows you have established around those transactions today. I want to take a look at a different type of part. Um, this part, FPA, is a make part. So it has 
a bill of material. And we can see that bill of material here. And this illustrates that strategic decoupling that I talked about. Um, I think we've got about six levels to this bill of material. Um, any item with this red, yellow, or green icon is going to be a buffered item. Um, so we can expect constant material availability of that. Any item with this gray icon is a non-buffered item. So it's either a make to order item or a buy to order item. And then this part PPA with this black circle around it, that's my longest non-buffered leg. So it's a buy to order item. It has a 25 day lead time. So anytime I want to make FPA, I have to first order PPA, wait 25 days for it to get to me. And then I can go through the production process with FPA. What this view will allow you to do is then determine what would happen to, for example, my lead time for FPA, which as of today is a cumulative lead time of 35 days. What would happen, oops, I collapsed that. What would happen if I made the decision to start stocking PPA and applied one of those buffers, thus decoupling ourselves from that 25 day lead time? That would then reduce the cumulative lead time for the finished good thus resulting in a uh, smaller buffer, lower inventory levels, et cetera. And then just like we looked at with that, um, the last part, I've got an order recommended against part FPA today. I could, if I wanted to, click this create work order, and that would then generate the work order transaction um, so that I can make FPA based on this buffer and net flow logic. So if you come into the individual SKU records, you can create the transactions accordingly based on the recommendations that IntuitFlow is making. But most of our clients have hundreds, if not thousands of items that they manage. And so they have to be able to um, execute on all of these recommendations in a more automated process. And that's where we come to kind of the day in the life of the planner. If I come in and want to see all of my priorities for that day, where do I go? And that's where our IntuaFlow Planner's workbench comes into play. Um, I've got this filtered down to a specific location and a specific planner. Um, we can add in additional filters as needed. These are just stock filters here. But I wanted to um, filter down the data for our purposes today. So this is showing me for the planner that I have selected, all of the items that planner is responsible for managing at the plant location. And the color coordination instantly tells me what needs my attention. Any items that are in green, that means that the net flow is in the green zone for that item. And so I'm in a good position. I don't need to take any action against that item today. Any item that's in yellow, the net flow is in the yellow zone of the buffer. Therefore, I have orders recommended against those items, but I probably don't need to look, at, um, look into them in any more detail. I can simply trust the logic and accept the recommendations that the system is giving me. And then any items that are in red, these are my highest priority items where the net flow is down into the uh, red zone. Now, what we can see today is that I just have two items that are in red and neither of those are buffered. We've got an item that's managed by a uh, static min max and an item that's non-buffered. So it's either make to order or buy to order. Anytime demand comes in against a non-buffered item, um, it will show up in red here so that we can place the corresponding supply order to fulfill that demand. And then down here at the bottom, we have items that are in blue, and I haven't talked about blue yet. What that indicates is that the green or the uh, net flow is over the top of the green zone, meaning we have too much supply plan for that item, and we can look for opportunities to reduce said supply. Maybe I have a work order scheduled for later this week that it turns out I don't actually need. And so I can cancel that and allocate capacity to a higher priority item. Or maybe I have too much material at one facility, but another facility needs to be replenished. And so I can transfer material from my facility over to that other facility, thus getting inventories in both locations to a more optimal level. So we'll have visibility here to that bimodal inventory distribution I talked about earlier, where we have too much of some material, too little of others, clear visibility so that I can correct um, that imbalance. And then for the items that we have orders recommended against, I can accept those via the accept recommended orders window. 
Um, again, we can add in filters. I'm not going to filter down for our purposes today. So this is showing me all of the items that I have um, uh, orders recommended against. And we can see that there are different types of items in here. There are going to be make parts, like part FP8 that we looked at. There might be buy parts. There might be distributed parts, et cetera. We can accept all of those recommendations from one screen here. So I can check mark these items one by one if I want to, or I could simply check mark all. We'll see in the order details, the system is summarizing everything that I'm approving. So from a purchasing standpoint, I'm approving orders for 77 items. Some of those are coming from the same vendors. So we're consolidating down to just 21 purchase orders and the total dollar value of that um, of those orders. So I'm approving purchase parts, I'm approving make parts, and I'm approving distributed parts. From a group planning standpoint, if you have the data set up um, within the items in NetSuite, we can also count or, or keep track of as we're approving items What's that going to mean from a pallet standpoint, a truck standpoint, container standpoint, et cetera? So it helps us to more effectively fill out um, a full truckload, for example, or a full, a full container. So I've got 123 items selected for approval. If I click this generate orders button, that would then create all of the corresponding transactions, purchase orders, work orders, transfer orders. Um, and they would just go through whatever kind of approvals, processes, or workflows you have um, built around those transactions today. And then, boom, just like that, you've taken care of all of your planning priorities for the day and can move on to, to um, additional tasks. Now, most of what we've covered so far all has to do with the buffer sizing, where the net flow falls within the buffer. And based on that, um, do we need to um, replenish any of our items? But that's not a complete picture. I talked about that running balance column there and there earlier, and there can be situations where the net flow is in a perfectly fine position within the buffer, but based on the timing of supply and demand, I might have uh, potential stock out issues, for example. And that's where our IntuaFlow alerts come into play. And there are three types of alerts sorted by priority. The first alert is called a current inventory alert. And this shows me items where I am currently stocked out. Stock outs are bad. We want to avoid them, um, but we'll never be able to 100% eliminate them. Life happens, right? So we want to be alerted to whenever stock outs occur. That's what this current inventory alert shows us. Please forgive some of the alert dates here in the demo site. So this is showing me this part at this location stocked out on this date. This bottleneck transaction is the demand transaction that caused that stock out to occur. So part uh, PPB is a component on at least one bill of material. Whenever this work order was due, that caused me to stock out. And then this supply order to expedite shows me any open supply order, if it exists, that if I can expedite it in, it will alleviate that stock out. So when I receive this open supply order, that will then alleviate the stock out that this work order caused. So current inventory alerts show us items where we are stocked out today. Next, we have what's called a material synchronization alert. And this shows us items where we're not stocked out today, but based on the timing of the supply and demand transactions that are in the system, we will stock out in the future. So taking this last item here, for example, when this bottleneck transaction, when this sales order comes due on May 28th, it will cause me to stock out unless I can expedite this open supply order to arrive in my materials prior to when this sales order comes due. So this is gonna give us insight and visibility into items where we need to pull in supply, push out demand, um, things of that nature to prevent those stockouts from occurring. As you can imagine, if I do nothing, then eventually the sales order comes due, causes me to stock out, at which point this item would move up the priority list. It would no longer be a material synchronization alert. It would move up to one of those current inventory alerts.
And then the last type of alert here is called a uh, projected stock out. This shows us items where we don't have any bottleneck transactions in the system, meaning we don't have any demand that's already in the system in the future that will trigger one of those material synchronization alerts. But if my consumption continues at its current rate based on my inventory and open supply, I will stock out at some point in the future. So I like to think about this alert um, in the context of a company that does same day shipping. They're never going to have any of those transactions due out in the future um, because they ship everything same day. But we know what their current rate of consumption is. We can overlay that against their on-hand inventories and their um, open supply orders and then project if that rate of consumption continues at its current rate, will they stock out at some point in the future or not? So the IntuiFlow alerts give us that extra level of visibility, not just what do I need to replenish, but based on the timing of supply and demand, am I going to have any potential issues um, in the future? So that makes up the core of the um, of the materials planning side of things. Now I talked about the SNOP process where we need to be able to look out into the future. The um, demand-driven MRP gives us the best possible demand signal to plan inventory levels on a day-to-day -day basis, but we still need that future visibility to plan for future scenarios. And that's where the SNOP tool comes into play. And what the SNOP tool does is going to take our existing buffer settings and based on a forecast that we upload into the system, project those settings out into the future. So I've got this SNOP tab here, and then we can see the projection. The forecast of demand pulses, this is showing me on a weekly basis what my forecast is. And then above that, we can see what's essentially a simulation. If this forecast comes to fruition, based on the settings that we have in the system today, what will my buffer behavior be? What will my inventory behavior be, et cetera? And so we can see our inventory line here, our projected inventory is this purple line. And we can see that when we have a big spike in consumption come in, that's gonna cause us to stock out. What this then allows us to do is make adjustments to the buffer today to prevent that stock out from occurring. So I'm gonna to go to this run simulation section. And this is basically a, a sandbox where I can play around with different um, settings in the buffer to find the right setting that would prevent that stock out from occurring. So I can adjust different buffer variables. What would happen if I changed the buffer profile? What might happen if I adjusted the lead time or adjusted the MOQ that I'm using to size the green zone, et cetera? Or I can experiment with what are called adjustment factors, which are ways to proactively adjust the buffer based on uh, market intelligence, known trends in the business. For example, many of our clients order um, materials from China and have to deal with factory outages during Chinese New Year. Well, we can apply an adjustment factor so that one lead time prior to that known downtime from their suppliers, they can order additional material to get them through that time period. Um, in this case, I'm going to apply an adjustment factor in an attempt to prevent this stock out from occurring. And so we can see we're stocking out around May 3rd, and that goes through roughly May 15th. And so I can add additional coverage to my buffer in either units or days. I'm going to add 20 additional days of coverage there. I'm going to start this on May 1st, end on May 15th. And now what this, the adjustment factor is going to do that you'll see in a moment is add that additional coverage into my buffer and offset it by the lead time. And so... The start of that adjustment factor is May 1st, one lead time before that. We'll see that my buffer thickens itself quite dramatically in this case, and it prevents that stock out from occurring. Now, in this example, maybe 20 days coverage was too much. Maybe I only need 10 days. And so in this 
simulation, I can play around with these parameters, find the setting that, um, that I'm comfortable with. And then if I were to click this update into a flow record, it would then write that adjustment um, back into the back into the um, the into a flow record that we were looking at earlier here. So we can make those adjustments on an item by item basis. Um, when we run the SNOP, because again, if you have hundreds or thousands of items, you can't go into every single items um, SNOP tab to make sure that the um, there aren't any stockouts coming in the near future. We have to be able to be alerted to that. And so when I run the SNOP, there's a tab here for the um, SNOP results. And this is gonna alert us to any items that we are projecting to stock out on over a relevant time horizon. And what I mean by the relevant time horizon is that item PPJ with a 10 day lead time. If I'm projecting that I'm gonna stock out on that 15 days from now, that's very relevant to me. And I need to do something today to prevent that from occurring. But if I'm projecting that I'm gonna stock out 12 months from now, that's irrelevant to me. That time horizon is so much longer than the lead time. So much can change by then. Um, I don't need to take any action on it. So we only wanted to be alerted to items that are stocking out or projecting to stock out over a relevant time horizon, um, depending on the lead times for the items. In this case, I've only got five items loaded into my SNOP module. Um, I'm alerted here at the top these items I'm projecting to stock out on. We can see how many days I'm projected to stock out. These items I'm not projecting to stock out on. So there's the idea of exception management. If I'm not projecting any issues, I don't need to do anything with those items. I can focus on these higher priority items that we are um, projecting to have stock out issues with. And then I could click on that view button there to um, open up the Intuit flow record and get back into that analysis and simulation exercise that we did just a moment ago. So we'll be alerted to all of our items in mass, and then we can export all of this data. So one of the things that the, that the SNOP module will do, in addition to um, letting us ensure that we're not going to be stocking out, is it will give us our expected supply requirements. We can look at it on a daily or more commonly a weekly basis. So this item, for example, um, I can see what my inventory is projecting to be on a weekly basis. And then I can also see the supply table shows me how much supply I'm projecting to generate on a weekly basis. So in this example, the week of May 21st, I'm projecting that I'm going to order 27 units of this item um, from my supplier. So from a purchasing standpoint, these supply tables can be shared with your suppliers. That's your supply projection to help them plan a bit more effectively. From a production standpoint, this can be shared with the, uh, with the plant so that they can compare um, their capacities to what we are projecting to need and ensure that we're going to be able to, um, to satisfy that. And all of that data is exportable into CSV. So lots of clients, they'll um, typically run this SNOP process on a monthly basis when the forecast gets updated. They can then export the data, um, manipulate it, build out those supply plans that they can share with their suppliers, et cetera. So um, gives clients good effective visibility in planning for future scenarios, as well as improving their collaboration with their suppliers or their production facilities, et cetera. All right, the last thing that I wanted to touch on is from a reporting standpoint, how do we monitor the overall health of the environment and ensure that, that we're in a good position over time. That's where what's called our buffer trend graph comes into play. I'm gonna take a couple lines off here. It's a two axis graph. So starting on the left, the um, color coordination here shows me over time, and I believe I'm looking over the past three months in this example, you can adjust that time horizon as you see fit. Um, the percentage of my parts based on where the net flow falls within the buffer. So at the start of this time period, we see we've got about 50% of my parts that are in blue, meaning we're over 
oversupplied, have too much inventory um, for about half of my parts. Then I've got a lot of green, a little bit of yellow, and a little bit of red. Very common when we first implement with a client, when we run this report, because they suffer from that bimodal inventory distribution, we'll see a lot of blue and a lot of red. It's very easy to get rid of the red. There's going to be orders recommended against those, and we simply um, approve those recommendations. Usually the items that are in blue, that's inventory that's already on hand, so we can't get rid of that quite as fast. Um, we simply don't order any more of it and slowly eat away at that inventory. And so what we should see is over time, slowly getting rid of the blue, getting rid of the red, and eventually we would want to see um, mostly green and yellow on this report. And then on the right hand side, we have our inventory value. We can see our expected average inventory and compare that to what our actual on-hand inventories are. And what we want to see is over time, that actual on-hand inventory, this purple line here, aligning with and fluctuating around this expected average inventory or target inventory levels. And what we see here, because we have all of those items that are oversupplied, the actual starts out way above the expected average, but slowly but surely, we're eating away at those overstock materials and getting that actual on-hand inventory back down to our target levels where it will be fluctuating around the, the expected average inventory. So this is a tool that our clients use to monitor the overall health of their environment. Our client success team monitors these for our clients as well. Um, this is just looking at the aggregate view, but you can add in filters. And so if you have multiple facilities, you can track how is facility A performing compared to facility B. You could um, filter down to specific planners, different material types, um, purchase parts versus make parts, et cetera. So can really get granular um, with the reporting here. But again, this is um, a very visual, very easy to understand way to, to monitor the overall health of um, the environment. All right. Well, that is everything that I had planned on covering with everybody today. So with that, um, I'd like to open up the floor in that Q&A box. If anybody has any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A um, Q box so that we can answer those. Do we have any questions? Hey, Victor, I do see one coming in that asks, how do I know if my company is a good fit for this cementer and MRP approach? How do you know if the company is a good fit? That's a great question. And that's um, the reason why we do these simulations. Um, it's really, really critical for us to ensure that every single client that we bring on board is going to be a good fit because not necessarily does every single industry vertical out there fit in with this um, DDMRP logic. For example, I would never go try to sell um, into a flow to a high fashion company like Gucci, uh, just based on the nature of their business. They're not a great fit. We could get into the details of why later. Um, but the simulation allows us to ensure that it is going to be a good fit. We don't um, we as a company have zero interest in trying to implement with a client that's not going to be a good fit because every single client that we bring on board, we want to be able to achieve these type of results and be able to be a great reference for us. So that's why we do these simulations. Um, it does a great, um, a great job of really pulling the picture together because it's one thing to see this in a, in a demonstration like I walked through today. It's a whole nother animal to see your actual items, your actual demand patterns, and talk through various scenarios. So again, this is done at no cost to, um, to the client. And um, if you'd like to go through this exercise, please reach out to us. We've got um, very simple data templates, um, minimal amount of data that we need to be able to run that. Let's see, okay, we've got good questions um, uh, um, coming in here. So 
Cheryl, thanks for, for reaching out. We'll reach out afterwards to uh, set up some time to discuss in more detail. Jeffrey asks, will the system automatically create blanket purchase orders with separate release dates? Um, and the, the answer to that is it depends on the, um, the way you're using NetSuite. So there is a blanket PO um, transaction type within NetSuite. Um, in Tuaflow, uh, typically doesn't create those blanket purchase orders, but the separate um, release dates will be created. So um, generally speaking, a client would input their blanket PO for the year, and then based on the recommendations of Intuaflow, as those get accepted, it would then um, reduce the total left on that blanket PO. Um, good question, Jeffrey. I hope that answered it sufficiently. Um, Somebody asked about pricing, of course. Everybody wants to know about pricing. Um, the way that our licensing works, we're a um, subscription-based software. So there's an annual subscription to the software along with a one-time implementation fee for the professional services, um, consulting, training, and whatnot to get you up and running. The pricing we do custom client by client. So we offer unlimited users, and we simply price the subscription based on the size and scope of the organization as far as Intuaflow is concerned. So based on what Intuaflow would be managing, that annual subscription starts at $15,000 per year and then um, uh, increases just based on the size of the company's environment. Um, if you're interested in more details, let us know and, um, and, and, and we can give you a more concrete answer on that. Lindsay asks, what must you have in place before implementing into a flow? Great question. Number one, NetSuite. <laughs> um, it's built into NetSuite, so we have to have that in place. Um, that being said, we have implemented alongside clients that are in the NetSuite implementation process. And so um, uh, our implementation is much, much less of a lift from a full-on ERP implementation, and we typically get clients live on NetSuite in the, or for our NetSuite clients in the two to three month range. Um, so if you are in the process of implementing NetSuite, we have implemented alongside during that process. Um, once you have NetSuite in place, only requirements are that you have your item master data updated because that's the data that we pull um, from and making these calculations. And so we need to have accurate data. And then you simply need to be using um, the appropriate transactions. So um, sales orders, purchase orders, um, work orders, transfer orders, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Mike asks, what do you find as an average ROI for your solution? <laughs> That's a, a great question. Um, typically, um, and estimating that is something that uh, simulation process helps us to do. And it depends on, on the business. And so we've had clients that we've implemented with that are um, very mature businesses, have been um, in business for a really long time. What they typically see is inventory levels um, decreasing, service levels increasing, et cetera. Um, we have other clients that are um, very much in the growth stage. And so what we see uh, with those type of clients typically is that because we are um, giving them that more reliable signal, improving their service levels, we're enabling increased revenue growth um, while at the same time inventory levels lagging behind that. If you're growing, your inventories are going to have to grow to um, keep pace with that growing demand. But what we've seen with this methodology is that inventory growth typically is much lower from a percentage standpoint than revenue growth. Um, Todd asks, do I have to create work orders far enough in advance to match my component PO lead times to avoid stockouts? Um, depends on the scenario. Typically, the, the way that a client would configure their environment is that they apply these buffers at the raw material or component level, and that buffer then protects inventory levels to ensure that those components are available 
as work orders are needed. So for example, um, if we have an individual component that is featured on 100 different bills of material, the production of those 100 finished goods will all aggregate as the demand against that single component, thus sizing its buffer so that it will be available whenever any of those work orders are, um, are scheduled. Now, whether we're buffering at the finished good level or not just depends on the nature of the business. So you might have a scenario where we are buffering our finished goods, in which case we would be creating those work orders just based on the, um, the buffer recommendations like we talked about. We have other clients where they are not buffering at the finished location because they're highly complex, customized finished products, um, for example. But in that case, it's important that we buffer at the raw material or component level to ensure that when we need to make one of those customized finished goods, we'll have the material needed and we can meet our um, lead time promises to our clients. But good question. Um, Lindsay asks, do you need to be tracking inventory in NetSuite? Um, we need to have the, uh, the item records set up within NetSuite, so yes. Um, lots of good questions. Any other questions out there? We've got just a few minutes left here in the session. So any other questions um, that I can answer for us here today? Looks like the answer to that is no. Um, if you do have questions that come to mind after the call, we covered a lot. I know it's a lot to digest, but if other questions come to mind, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you'll see my email address here on the screen, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, we've got a contact us form on our website as well. Lots of additional content on that website from client case studies, client testimonials, things of that nature. So please go over there, check out that information. Um, like I said, this uh, session has been recorded, and so you'll receive uh, a, an email here shortly with a link to that recording, um, so you can go back and, and rewatch some of the content, uh, maybe answer some of your questions that way. I want to, again, say thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I um, was really excited for the opportunity to present um, this to you, and if you'd like to talk in, in any more detail, please don't hesitate to reach out. All right, thanks so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.